Thank you, uh, Michael. And look, I'm certainly not going to solve uh, the problems. In fact, I'm probably going to leave with you, leave you with more problems um, after I speak uh, this evening because I, I don't think I've got the solutions, but I can certainly, I guess, acknowledge some of the problems and, and the challenges uh, that, uh, that lie ahead. But can I begin by echoing uh, your, your comments, Michael, in thanking um, you for being here tonight and your generosity uh, that you give to the church because I think, as Michael uh, has pointed out, uh, a lot of uh, the services that provide great support uh, in our community uh, don't come through government. Uh, they come through religious groups, and I'll touch. I'll, I'm going to touch on that um, in in my speech uh, this evening. So a few years ago, uh, a consultancy released a study which showed that 70% of wealthy families uh, lose their wealth by the second generation. By the third generation, around 90% have completely squandered their fortunes. That study was about material wealth, but I think it also applies to cultural wealth as well. Here in Australia, we've inherited cultural riches that would be the envy of just about every single generation that has gone before us. Among those riches is the extraordinary freedom of religion that we enjoy, to worship, to believe, to express those values, uh, and to live according to them. And it hasn't always been that way. Up until the second half of the last century, sectarian divisions were still commonplace in many spheres of Australian life, from the school system to the professions and the public service. But the latter decades of the 20th century and the beginning of this century have been a golden era for religious freedom. Yet barely one generation on, this wealth of freedom that we have inherited is now in danger of being lost. And part of the reason I think that is the case is because a growing number of Australians can't empathise with people of faith anymore. It's almost like a foreign language. But that's not entirely surprising. Religious observance and affiliation in Australia is in steady decline. The proportion of Australians reporting no religion is now higher than any particular denomination, according to the 2016 census, for the first time ever. In 2016, 30% of Australians said they have, have had no religion, which is a steep rise from 22% in 2011. Just five years. Bundled together, Christians still make up 52% of the population, but that is down from 74% in 1991. So the trend lines are very clear. These trends mean, in my view, that believers are constantly on the, on the defensive in the battle of religious freedom. So tonight I want to talk about how religious freedom is under threat and some of the things I think can be done. Now firstly, while I'm sure many people here tonight would feel that religious freedom is at risk, there's also a lot to be grateful for. The fact that I'm standing here, a Catholic MP, talking to a mostly Catholic audience in a public forum free from <coughs> any interference is a positive thing in itself. There are plenty of places around the world where simply an event like this would be monitored, outlawed, or even attract violence. Christians, as we know, are among some of the most persecuted people across the world. Whether it's communist dictatorships or Islamic theocracies, professing the Christian faith in many parts of the world can quite often be a matter of life and death. The organisation Open Doors reports that an, an estimated 4,305 Christians were killed for their faith in the last 12 months. That puts the Australian perspective, uh, uh, experience into perspective and we should count our blessings. But here in the rapid, rapidly secularising West, religious believers face threats of a different sort, and they are growing quickly. First, it is no exaggeration to say that people of faith are being squeezed out of public life unless they agree to keep their faith hidden. And that, I think that's a key takeaway from the Israel Flower Saga. Essentially, Australia's best rugby player paraphrased a section of the Bible on social media. It was a strong message and was, seen, and was seen to be inflammatory and cause people offence. But he did it in his own time and the beliefs that he expressed he genuinely held and according to him they had to do with his Christian faith. Yet Rugby Australia decided that expressing one's faith like that was incompatible with Israel's job of running around on a grassy field kicking and passing a synthetic ball. One wonders though if Israel Folau had quoted the, his Bible to call to action on refugees and climate change if the reaction might have been somewhat different. 
However, I don't necessarily think Rugby Australia shouldn't have the right to protect their own brand. This is a very complex area where there are competing rights at play. There is also a challenge being experienced by many religious believers in other workplaces where their traditional beliefs are in conflict with the modern diversity politics and activities. Today our basic freedoms are more important than ever because they allow people of different values, of different views, of different beliefs to peacefully and productively coexist. And that's why I don't support calls from people in the Christian community that radio host Kyle Sanderlands should be sacked due to his comments on the Virgin Mary. Yes, I found those comments tasteless, vulgar and offensive. But he has the right to an opinion, however vulgar and ill-informed that may be. In fact, that's what Cole's brand is all about. What we're seeing here, though, is the beginning of, the, of efforts to make it harder for Christian organisations to maintain their Christian character. And this is the issue that's making its way right now through the Victorian justice system, with a legal dispute between a teacher and a former employer, a, a, a Christian college in Ballarat. The school teaches that for Christians, marriage can only be between a man and a woman. The teacher disagreed and informed the school of her support for same-sex marriage. Now, exactly what happened next is a matter of dispute. But the end result was that both parties stuck to their beliefs and the teacher now no longer works at that school. Now, the, te the teacher is suing for discrimination. The question the courts will have to answer is, can a Christian college insist that its teachers teach a Christian view of marriage. Now, if the court answers that question in the negative, Christian schools potentially have to water down their beliefs and potentially lose their religious character. Now, I'm always amused when certain politicians argue that this is an acceptable outcome, which they would never accept for themselves. Political parties demand unrestricted freedom to hire people who agree with what they believe. There is no way that the Greens would continue to employ an official who publicly opposed core Green policies like questioning climate change. What religious institutions are seeking is not a right to discriminate, but a right to select, to preference those who hold their values and ethos, just as political parties do. Freedom of religion has also been restricted via laws that aim to sideline religious believers out of major professions. Sadly, uh, this was a feature uh, of the abortion legislation uh, recently in the New South Wales Parliament. Uh, the law allows doctors with a conscientious objection to refuse to perform an abortion. However, the bill originally also required objecting doctors to refer the request to a doctor who they know will perform it. This is something that every pro-life doctor I have ever met also objects for, for reasons of conscience. They don't want to facilitate and cannot facilitate something that they believe to be wrong. And requiring to them to do so is a violation of freedom of conscience. But this bill went even further. It explicitly made any pro-life doctor's refusal to facilitate an abortion a professional conduct issue. This requirement was watered down uh, during the hours of debate, so doctors can now direct mothers to a generic health information service, but the intent at the time was clear uh, and, the, and the amendment which we moved um, in the lower house on that point, uh, which was stronger, was rejected. Another way religious freedom is being weakened by governments, uh, explicit, uh, is by governments explicitly intervening in uh, specific religious doctrines. And when I was growing up, I had a lot of uh, my friends, particularly in university politics, on the left, uh, lecture me about the importance of the separation of church and state. But that separation goes both ways. Last month, Victoria became the fourth state or territory to pass laws requiring priests and other religious ministers to breach the confessional seal to report cases of child abuse. Now, I understand the motivation and the rationale for this legislation, as I'm sure everyone here does. As a Catholic, I find the sexual abuse and subsequent cover-ups that have gone on in the church a crushing betrayal, uh, not only of the victims, but of believers too. We all share in the responsibility to combat the plague of sexual abuse of children and minors and make sure it never happens again. And at the same time, though, we need to be clear about what this kind of law does. It compels, under threat of imprisonment, ministers of religion to violate their conscience 
in a way that is so grave that it will result in their summary expulsion from their church. That isn't just a matter of preference. It's a matter of deep theological conviction that the confessional seal is sacrosanct for every priest and every penitent, no matter who and no matter what sins are confessed. It is an essential doctrine for many Christian denominations and no state legislator can change that fact. But if governments claim the authority to outlaw one religious doctrine, it's only a matter of time before they will outlaw others. So each of these examples reflect changes that are taking place right now and suggest the prognosis for religious freedom in Australia is not good. We've reached a point where in, a, in very practical, tangible ways, Christians are being forced to, to, to choose to serve either God or Caesar. Secular Australia may preach the gospel of diversity, tolerance and inclusion, but that is meaningless unless those same principles are also extended to people of faith. And that is why I believe it's important for legislators to step in and ensure basic rights are protected. I also believe the federal government has an obligation to repay the faith shown to it by the quiet Australians at the last election. Broadly speaking, there are three different approaches to dealing with religious freedom in law. The first is through enshrining a positive right to religious freedom akin to a concept of a Bill of Rights. Now, I understand that there are some religious leaders and conservative members of parliament who are calling for this approach, but I believe it is misguided. And I say this because as a legislator, it's important that people understand whatever the state gives you, the state can take away. Any positive law that a liberal and national coalition implements today will simply be changed by a Labor-Greens alliance tomorrow. One need only turn their minds back to some of the inflammatory rhetoric by certain Labor and Greens politicians a few months ago when they thought they had the federal election in the bag. But under no illusions, the quiet Australians have only won a, uh, so be under no illusions that the quiet Australians have only won a stay of execution from a political class overly hostile to their beliefs. In essence, by adopting this approach, you are putting your future religious freedom squarely into the hands of those who most want to take it away. This approach also violates a foundational principle of liberalism, and that is this. It is not up, it is not up to the pleasure of the state to grant us our fundamental rights, only to recognise them. Our classical liberal freedoms of speech, thought, association and religion are inherent to who we are and cannot be removed by the stroke of a legislator's pen. It was for this principle that the individual is more important than the collective state, that the liberal West stood up to totalitarian re regimes of the past. But I'll say this, all Australians, whether religious or not, have a stake in whether religious freedom is maintained. Because if this is the first fundamental right to fall, others will soon follow. Another second possible approach that's been raised to religious freedom is simply providing carve-outs in existing anti-discrimination law. But these exemptions give the impression that churches only want a license to do something bad when that is not what religious freedom is about at all. This is especially due to the growing tendency by many of the political left to classify views that they don't agree with as hate, bigotry, that cause harm and therefore must be silenced. In other words, religious rights end where their feelings begin. This carve-out mentality also risks being one day simply being removed uh, by successive governments. The Greens have long campaigned to eliminate the existing religious protections and they are already calling this new bill a Trojan horse for hate. In line with this thinking, you should expect to see further calls and campaigns for religious institutions to be stripped of their tax-exempt status. After all, why should a taxpayer subsidise bigotry? The third approach to religious freedom is the one the Attorney General Christian Porter has chosen, and that is to make it unlawful to discriminate on the basis of religion. Now, credit where it's due, I think this is at least an improvement on the existing exemption-based protections. It's also a good sign that no one is entirely happy uh, with the proposed bill, which probably shows that Christian is on the right track. However, while the philosophy of the bill is sound, there are some areas that need attention, 
such as the rights of religious organisations and particularly on the selection of staff. The idea of a religious freedom commissioner is also not particularly appealing, uh, given that other human rights commissioners in Australia have hardly covered themselves in glory when it comes to defending basic human freedoms like freedom of speech. So in my view, this bill, whilst still needing some work, is the least worst option available in a hotly contested area and very challenging and difficult area of competing rights. But in some ways, it's sad that we have reached a point where religious freedom has to be legislated at all. And it highlights just, and it highlights and just shows how divided our society has become. As a secular world drifts away from traditional Judeo-Christian understandings of, mor of morality, articulating Christian teachings in the public square will become even more challenging than it is today. But that shouldn't necessarily worry us, because as journalist Rodriguez said, a church that looks and talks and sounds just like the world has no reason to exist. At the end of the day, no law is going to solve the challenges that religious people face, and no politician is going to single-handedly turn things around. As American publisher Andrew Breitbart observed, politics is downstream from culture. Right now, the Culture River is a torrent, and as the abortion debate in New South Wales uh, has shown, even the most simple and humane of amendments uh, have been swept away. And that includes an amendment, uh, a clear amendment, to ensure that children born alive after a failed abortion receive adequate medical care. It's disappointing that MPs, so many of them, rejected this amendment. But it's even more disappointing that a YouGov Galaxy poll found that more than 40% of the public also rejected it. And that poll was conducted in Conservative National Party seats. If you want parliaments and laws that respect and understand people of faith, you need to forge the pathway in the culture first. And the best way for Christians to change people's minds is simply to be good Christians in the world. As a wise man once said, you will know them by their fruits. Christians need to be so good that it's contagious. In the fourth century, that's exactly what the Christian population was doing in Rome. It was the good works that they did and the love that they had for one another that made them so attractive and so influential, not only on a political scale, but on a local scale as well. They were such a positive force in Rome that the Emperor Julian wanted to shut them down because they were making him look bad. His chief complaint was that Christians didn't just look after themselves, they looked after the poor, the downtrodden, people of every faith and of none. He wrote a letter where he said, it is disgraceful that when the impious Christians support not only their own poor, but ours as well. All men see that our people lack aid from us. The emperor even tried to mimic the Christian practice of charity by splurging public funds in those areas. Of course, his government-funded charity wasn't anywhere near as successful as the Christians, because they were motivated by something much deeper, love for their fellow man. When good Christians are a dynamic force in the communities where they live, where they work, they make a contribution to the common good that no government program can ever match. They give shape to the society they live in for the better. And when that happens, no one needs to make the case for freedom of religion. It speaks for itself. So to conclude, let me say this. There will always be powerful forces, like the Emperor Julian, who want to shut Christians out of public life. But even in history's most anti, brutal anti-Christian regimes, the flame has never, ever been fully stamped out as long as Christians keep the faith and put it into practice. Today, religious freedoms that we have taken for granted are steadily being eroded. That's not a good thing, but it reflects the great disconnect between religion and culture evident across our communities today. So while we can make our best efforts to defend our freedoms with laws to protect people of faith, in the long term, the solution is not going to come from a legislator's pen. The case for religious freedom is best made not with words, but with action. Not by telling, but by showing how faith 
makes our society a better place to live. Thank you.